When my son was five years old, he put me to shame as the supposed expert on creativity. I was preparing a keynote talk on creativity that night to 300 corporate executives, and I had the whole talk worked out except the creative opening, which you know is very important in a talk. And I'm sitting in the car, we've picked him up from school, my wife's driving, I'm sitting in the passenger seat, I've got papers all over me, and my son's having his afternoon tea in the back of the car. And I'm thinking, creative opening, creative opening. I, I have to have a creative opening. And my son takes a, a bite out of his biscuit, and he holds it up at, at five years old, super excited, and says, look, Dad, a racing car. And I'm thinking, creative opening, creative opening. I have to have a creative And as a typical dad, I turn around and say, not now, son, I'm busy. <laughs> and he takes another bite out of the biscuit and says, look, Dad, a mountain with snow on it. And again, I'm thinking, not now, son, I'm trying to be creative, don't bother me. <laughs> seven times, seven times he took a bite out of his biscuit and could see something. And then it hit me. Here was I, as an adult, desperately trying to be creative. And my son was in the back of the car demonstrating divergent thinking, Rorschach, and alternative uses. As a five-year-old, and I'm trying to be the supposed expert on creativity. Now, by the next morning, when I was, by that night when I was giving the talk, I still didn't have a creative opening. So I brought out six executives on stage. And I gave each of them a biscuit. <laughs> and I thought this would be a nice thing. I, I, this was many years ago when I was ignorant about the research of kids and adults. And I asked the executive to take a bite out of his biscuit. And, 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 and I knew as soon as he took a bite out of his biscuit what was about to happen. Because I was going to ask him what he saw. And he took a bite, and as I was walking with the microphone towards him, he went pale white with fear. And I said, what do you see? And he mumbled into the microphone, a biscuit. <laughs> That's all he could see. Here was I trying to be, as adults, we're trying to be creative. And kids seem to be doing it naturally. Now, put your hand up if you have children. Put your hand up if you think your children are creative. Now, just to do a benchmark, if you understand me, put your hand up if you were once a child. <laughs> Fantastic. 90% of people were once children. And keep your hand up if you remember being creative as a child. You enjoyed being creative. Now, watch this one. Keep your hand up if you think you are more creative now than you were when you were five years old. Let's just look around the room. We've worked with, as, as Ben said, with tribal groups through to CEOs. We've been doing this for, for many, many years. And the research that we've seen, what we see out there, reflects the real research in the workplace. 98% of kindergarten children score high as geniuses in creative thinking. That drops to 2% when we become adults. To go even a little bit further, studies have also revealed that while we are getting smarter from an IQ perspective, 10 points per generation of what's known as the Flynn effect, from a CQ perspective, our creative quotient has actually been flattening or declining since the mid-90s. Now, if you couple that with one of the biggest surveys that IBM have ever done with corporate executives to 1,500 CEOs around the world, and ask them, what is the most important character as a leader going forward in the next five years? Creativity came up as number one. So I would have to say there is clearly a problem, and I'm going to call it a crime. Now, we have created seven fictional characters from our research of what kills and blocks the creative process. And I want you to imagine you are a detective and we're asking the question, who killed creativity, with what weapon, and where? We worked with a neuroscientist and a psychologist to try and validate the years of research that we'd been working with on what blocks the creative process. And we came up with a game metaphor. 
So I want to look at some of the key suspects today. So the suspects are that I want to ask you is, what kills creativity? Was it pressure with a weapon of crushing coercion in the boss's office? Or was it bureaucracy with a weapon of intractable intolerance in the finance department? What kills creativity? Somewhere along the line, these fictional characters get inside our heads, they get inside our organizations, and they can block the creative process, preventing us from lifting off. At one particular company, we ran a workshop where every single table, independently of other tables, believed that what blocked creativity for them was pessimism with a weapon of noxious negativity in the canteen. Now, if you compare that to a company like Google that have actually made a science out of creating creative environments, Google knows how to harness the energy out of people rather than coax it out. They, they create places where people can go together and be creative. Where, where uh, canteens used to be all about workplace productivity, now it's about creating a sense of community. Now, sadly, the, the CEO of the company that I worked with when we ran that diagnostic and we said it was pessimism in the coffee shop with negativity, came to me in the break and boasted. He was proud of it. He said, Andrew, I deliberately make the food bad and the coffee cheap so I can get people back to work as quickly as possible. <laughs> he had no idea that he was killing creativity and innovation. No wonder the research shows that only 21% of the workforce are engaged at any one time. 21% of the workforce. Now, you might not have the budget of Google, but let me ask you in your workplace, do you have stained coffee cups piling up in the sink or food in the fridge, a place where people want to eat and go back to work, or how many of you eat at your work desk? We need these places where ideas can collide, where people can become creative. So in our 15 years of helping companies with design thinking, working with people to try and be creative, we've been gathering excuses. And as I mentioned, we worked with a neuroscientist to try and validate those excuses. And we came up with seven killers of creativity, seven suspects. And I want to ask you to think of those suspects in your own mind. At one end of the lineup is the blatant killer of creativity, control. And control shuts down what's known as the default network in our brain. The cost of bullying has been em estimated at $1.2 million per year for an organization of 1,000 people. There are more psychopaths in executive positions than there are in English prisons. <laughs> it's been described as a, a, a psychopath in a suit, has been described as madness without delirium. Now, what about fear? We've all felt the paralyzing effect of fear. Fear puts us into what's known as a dorsal dive, shifting our, shifting our brain from the prefrontal creative cortex to the back brainstem of our brain where the emergency fight, flight, or uh, freeze mode happens. And when that happens, when you're responding to an emergency, there is no chance to be creative, which is great. We need that to survive. But how many of our workplaces today live in a constant state of fear? where that adrenaline's constantly kicking in. You see, fear moves the brain from open possibilities to proclivity and probability. Now, as we go further down the lineup, we have the killers, the more sinister suspects that kill creative thinking using stealth and creating blind spots. Newsfeed algorithms filter out diverse opinions as they tailor our news to the ideas we've already explored. So much so that comedian Stephen Colbert said that we have created a safe space where like-minded folks can hear things they already agree with from people's opinions they already know. As a result, our minds slip into pettiness. We spend our life def being defined by 164 characters, how many Facebook posts we get, and watching reality TV. Dennis Miller despises our, despairs about our, our generation when he says that never have lives less lived been more chronicled. Never have lives less lived, been more chronicled. Then as we go further down the lineup, there are the killers of creativity that spread like an infection, apathy and pessimism. 
when someone says, I've done that before, and someone says, oh yeah, it doesn't matter. They're the big killers as well, but who cares about those ones? Now, let's talk about the, let's put a magnifying glass on the killer that has the greatest uh, effect on the audiences that we've worked with, and that's the killer of pressure. Why is pressure such a big killer of creativity? Because we love it. When I ask you in the workplace, how are you today? How do you answer? We love to say we're busy. Corporate executives wear pressure as a badge of honor. Hello, I'm Andrew, and here's my friend Pressure. It's cool to hang out with Pressure. The other killers we can see coming, but we welcome pressure into our lives. And, and whilst we might leave control and, and, and narrow-mindedness back in the workplace, we bring pressure home with us. And my wife hates it when I bring pressure to bed. Because it's not her that wakes me up at 4 o'clock. It's sometimes pressure waking me up at 4 o'clock saying, hey, Andrew, remember that email you have to send? Pressure, a huge killer of creativity. So let's leave the office for a minute and head home. Who checked their emails or who checks their emails before they come to work in the morning? Who, who checks things before they come to work in the morning? Put your hand up if you check your emails or, or do some work-related stuff before breakfast. Okay, hands up if you do work-related stuff not just before breakfast, but before you get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> Addiction to email can lower your IQ twice as much as smoking marijuana. <laughs> we lose 2.1 hours of productivity every time in the day for wanting to touch our devices over 150 times a day. We're losing productivity. As a matter of fact, we start people early these days. This is the new iPhone, iPad <laughs> porta potty. Now, the problem with that is I'm dyslexic and I wouldn't want to get my hands mixed up of what I did what with when uh, playing with that. Once our creative flow is broken, it takes an average of 25 minutes to get back into a creative state of flow. That means if you're being interrupted every 24 minutes, and 59 seconds, you can go hours, days, weeks, months, some of you even years, and never get into a creative state of flow. We fill up our working memory with so much stuff, but our working memory can only actually take about five things at once. And if that working memory is overflowed, we have no room to be creative. Now, overloading our brain through control, through fear, through pressure, is the same technique that magicians use and pickpockets use to woo their audience. So I'm going to ask Ben to come up here just a, a few minutes early before he should really come up here because I want to try something on him. Ben, would you mind just shuffling those cards for me? And uh, could you bring, let's just bring, would you mind just coming up to make sure that, you know, we can, we can validate this probably. Ben, just shuffle the cards. I'm going to take my jacket off because, uh, you, oh, you've got something up your sleeve or you've got some sort of special jacket. We've shuffled the cards, and I want you now to just take a card, please. Take a card. As a matter of fact, Ben's going to do this trick, not me. Just take a card, pick your own card, and give me the pack. Okay, and show it to your, your friend over there. Just to make sure that you can make sure it's a few people in the audience. And then just pop the card, just, just pop the card back into the pack. Now it's very, very important when you put it into the pack that you just, hang on, no, it's into the middle of the pack, try again. Put it very, very important when you put it into the pack that you put it into the middle of the pack because I'll explain why that's important in a minute. Now just put the card down so we know that it's gone into the middle of the pack. And now I want you to give the cards a quick shuffle again because as I said, Ben's going to do this trick, not me, and just hand the cards back to me. Don't drop them. And I want you to go and get that box that you got them out of. Just grab that box and make sure there's nothing special about that box. It's just a normal box from the magic shop. And we're going to put the, uh, <laughs> we're going to put the cards back into the box and then we're going to seal those cards off in the box. Seal the cards off. There's the box completely sealed with the lid on it and we're going to put those cards into Ben's top pocket. All right? Now let's just recap what's happened. Ben picked the cards up. Ben shuffled the pack. Ben then picked a card. We put the card back into the middle of the pack and then he reshuffled the pack, put the cards into the box, sealed the box and put the cards into Ben's pocket. 
Now, don't panic, that's not the card, is it? What would, it, what would happen in a simple version of this trick is a magician would have palmed the card right at the very beginning. That's why it was important it went into the middle. He would have palmed the card at the beginning of the trick and then all that banter and all that other stuff was just distraction, priming, overloading Ben's working memory. And then what the magician would do is he'd put the card behind his hand like that and he would say, I'm going to get the card out of that. Remember, that's a sealed pack of cards inside his pocket. I'm going to get the card out of that sealed pack. And he would bring his hand along like this and right, because the, eye, the, the, the hand's faster than the eye, he would then say, that's the card. And everyone would clap and they would go, fantastic. Now, I want to try something a little bit different because I know Ben's a bit nervous up in front of a thousand people, is that right? And uh, while we've been up here, I've been priming Ben, I've been uh, dealing with a bit of fear because your heart's probably racing at a high speed, uh, there's no pressure, a lot of pressure out there, and to a degree, I've been controlling, controlling the narrative. So as a result of that, I've been able to shut down Ben's creative problem solving. I don't want to, I don't want to upset you, but there is no such thing as magic. All a magician does is shut down your ability to solve problems. So what I'm going to do now, with, and we can bring the cameras in as close as you like, right now with absolutely nothing up my sleeve, with a clear set of hands, no palming, no sleight of hand, that card is somewhere in that pocket in a sealed pack of cards. I'm going to go in there like a good pickpocket and see if I can get that out. Three, two, one. Now, Ben, what was the card that you chose? And Ben, what is that card? The King of Spades. Now, just to add a little bit more fun to it, could you please check that that box is still a sealed box of cards? Yes. Lid's still on. Thank you very much, Ben. That was a, that was a great job. Now, those of you watching that on video, you don't have the same problem that Ben had. You can rewind it and, and look at it, and there's no fear and no control and no pressure. But up on stage, we were able to shut down that. Kids are the worst people to do magic on because they, can, they don't ask those questions. They, they can't be controlled like that. I practiced this in front of kids yesterday and they went, that's not a magic trick. They could easily see the answer. But us adults, the 98% the, the, the of us of adults that, that score low, we struggle. So I hope today has just given you a little taste of how we can lift off and how we can address the killers that are blocked in our lives in order for us to become creative. Thank you very much. Thank you.